tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Welcome back, friend, to Casa de Blood. As always, we've got cause for celebration. And to ring in National Clean Comedy Day, I brought along your favorite good-natured comedian, Paul J. McSorley. How you doing, Paul? Hey, Drew. How you doing, buddy? Dude, I got some great one-liners for you. Use them on your show. If nothing else, your kids will love them. What do you call an alligator who's carrying a compass? A navigator? <laughs> what do you call an alligator wearing a vest all the time? An investigator? Oh man, I've never seen a gator slap his knees before. <laughs> oh, hey, sorry dude, doubts to go. Hey, where are you going? It's National Blueberry Pie Day and I like pie. Well shit. Be sure to catch more of Paul's jokes and some excellent storytelling on his podcast, Fear from the Heartland, friends. It airs every Wednesday night on this very network. For now, come on inside. We've got work to do. Hmm. All right, that's better. So smoke them if you got them, friends, and drink those glasses to the bottom. Because your buddy Drew Blood has a tale to tell. But first, the elevator. Oh, hey, I didn't see you there. You know, Drew Bloodstark Tales is only one of the many shows on this network you could be listening to. We hope you'll subscribe to our entire lineup, including Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, Scary Stories Told in the Dark, Fear from the Heartland, and Horror Hill. All available on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform. Also, visit simplyscarypodcast.com to become a patron. For as little as $5 a month, you get our entire catalog ad-free and available to download or stream. A bargain. And now, back to the show. So tonight we welcome back Frederick Pangborn, Mr. Season 3, whom you might remember from Dead Storage, where the ravenous dwell, and most recently the Ninth Circle. In this story, we join a man who's about to receive a serious botany lesson. So without further delay, I give you, from author Frederick Pangborn, Death's Garden. It was during the late summer of 1936. I recall it vividly because it was a particularly hot summer that year when I had left Greenville, South Carolina and was en route to the eastern outskirts of Columbia. It was there at the Abigail Plantation that my story begins. Work, as you may or may not recall, was scarce at best, so when I was told they were looking for a handy person at the plantation house, I quickly made some inquiries and pulled a few strings to get my foot in the door for an interview by Ms. Beatrice Abigail. In addition, they informed me that the job's primary requirement, if I were to be selected, was to stay inclusively at the plantation until the repairs needed were completed to satisfaction. From what I was told of the potential pay, I could easily live with those conditions. Like I said earlier, work was scarce, and this seemed to be the opportunity of a lifetime for a single man like myself, and old Timmy Hawthorne knew an opportunity when it came knocking. It was well past noon when I had arrived at the Abigail Plantation. My old Ford coupe stopped at the mailbox alongside the dirt lane where the plantation's long driveway met the main road. Seemingly endless rows of tobacco stretched on either side of the lane to the main house. In the distance I could see the old white two-story mansion with mammoth pillars adorning its front. I ground the Ford into gear and turned onto the beaten road, leaving a trail of dust as I sped toward the house. 
Upon arrival at the mansion's weathered facade, a portly African woman was emerging from the double front doors. The screen door slamming behind her as she stepped out onto the porch, drying her hands on a washcloth. She stood watching as I climbed from my car and proceeded to make my way to the front porch, which stretched the entire face of the house. Afternoon, ma'am. I greeted as I pulled a handkerchief from my back pocket and wiped the sweat from my brow. Gonna be another hot one today. Afternoon, she replied, shoving the washcloth in the pocket of her apron. Probably a cook or cleaning woman, I surmised. You be Mr. Hawthorne? Well, yes, ma'am. That's me. Came straight from Greenville. Mm-hmm. Miss Abigail been expecting you. She around back in the garden. Come on in. I'll fetch her. As I climbed the stairs to the porch, she stepped aside and held the screen door open to let me pass. Her jet black hair showed strands of gray and was pulled tightly back into a bun. I had to politely sidestep to avoid her girth and swollen breasts to get inside. The screen door slammed again behind her as she too entered. You make yourself at home in the parlor, Mr. Hawthorne. I'll fetch Miss Abigail. Her voice was a I-couldn't-care-less monotone. I paced about the parlor for a few moments, examining some paintings and various knickknacks upon the shelves when I heard a screen door close from the back of the house and the sound of shoes approaching on the floor's wooden planks. Good afternoon, Mr. Hawthorne. I'm Beatrice Abigail, spoke the small elderly woman who stood in the parlor's entrance. She was your basic template for someone's grandmother. She was small, tiny little thing, no taller than my chest, and I'm five foot ten. Strands of her long gray hair dangled from under the sun-bleached, floppy-brimmed work hat she wore. Beads of sweat speckled her face, most likely from her working in the garden under this southern sun. Thin-framed glasses rested on the bridge of her nose. She wore a soiled work apron and was pulling work gloves from her bony hands, which were also stained with earth. I take it you had no trouble finding your way here? She spoke, pushing her glasses up off the tip of her nose. No, ma'am. Directions were point on. Good, good. Take a seat, please. She motioned with her hand to a plush sofa, which she sat on the opposite end. We sat for quite some time discussing what my duties would entail and what exactly she expected of me. It was pretty straightforward. I would tackle the laundry list of repairs and chores she made out and in return I would have free room and board, three hot meals a day, and be paid in monthly installments. She spoke of the other people that were working at the plantation as well. The large African woman was Mabel. As I had guessed, she was the cook and maid who had served with her for many long years. There were also a few other people who did not stay at the main house, but came and went as they toiled about their designated chores. Field workers and a variety of farmhands were a few mentioned. She also spoke of the late Mr. Abigail. Mr. Henry Abigail was a man of wealth who had accumulated his fortunes in both the tobacco and, surprisingly to me, the railroads. Oh, she had said. Henry had traveled the world, Mr. Hawthorne. Her eyes gleamed with excitement as she pointed to a large oil painting of a large balding man sporting a massive handlebar mustache and a black blazer. His face was a stone expression of determination. He spent a great deal of time in India, he did. With the railroad, of course. A worldly man she occasionally repeated. Always bringing exotic gifts from his overseas endeavors. Mabel had brought us out two large glasses of lemonade while we continued to converse, and by the time we finished sipping those cold drinks, I had secured the position as the handy person of the Abigail house. It was at this point that we moved from the parlor and strolled along the grounds of the plantation. Miss Abigail filled me in on the daily operations of the plantation and pointed out some projects that awaited me on her to-do list. Sagging gutters, broken shingles, and areas of the house that needed a fresh coat of paint were but a small sample of my tasks ahead. 
I was just glad to have steady work in these trying times. Our walk ended at the back of the house. Here the grass was like a thick lush carpet that stretched back almost a quarter mile into a distant tree line. Numerous maple and cypress trees stood tall in various locations, casting a welcoming shade. At the far end of the property, bordering the tree line, a large wooden trellis had been built. It almost looked like the framing of some type of barn. When I inquired what it was, Miss Abigail replied with a smile. That, Mr. Hawthorne, is my garden. We made our way across the lawn toward the garden. The late Mr. Abigail had that built for me back in 1926. I so enjoy toiling in the earth and growing things. There's no greater satisfaction than planting a seed and tending it as it grows into something of beauty. Wouldn't you agree, Mr. Hawthorne? Even though I've never been into gardening myself, ma'am, I must say that it sounds like it would be very satisfying. And by the time we reached the entrance arch to the garden's trellis, my shirt was becoming drenched with sweat and I had wiped my forehead a good half dozen times during the walk. I spend a great deal of time here, she blurted. It's a type of spiritual sanctuary, if you will. Tall hedges made a natural wall around the garden and permitted little for the viewer to behold. I could glimpse portions of green vines that had entwined their way up the trellis's wooden beams. Unusually bright yellow flowers with streaks of red adorned the vines. A few even poked their faces from the hedges. Those are some colorful flowers, I politely remarked. Indeed, she replied with a smile. They are my pride and joy. They were a gift from my husband shortly before he passed. We stood for a moment, simply doing nothing but looking at the hedges. I tried to peer through the open archway, but they planted another hedge just beyond the threshold, preventing any view within. I felt a tad uncomfortable, frankly. I mean, just standing there and not going in, so... I broke the silence with an uneasy chuckle. <laughs> so are you going to show me what you have growing inside? It was as if my words had broken her from some spell. I'm afraid not, she said suddenly, shaking her head and turning away from the garden. Like I said, Mr. Hawthorne, I think of this place as a Christian might hold a church sacred to them. Now she began walking back towards the house. I followed in tow as she spoke again. I have failed to mention that the garden is off limits to everyone here, and that includes you, Mr. Hawthorne. Now, don't let it rub you the wrong way, but I go there and tend things alone and have peace doing it. I understand, I replied. Well, I hope you do, Mr. Hawthorne. Because, like I tell everyone who works here, if I catch any of you cocksuckers anywhere near that garden, you'll be out of here before you know what hit you, and without a cent in your pocket from me. Do I make myself clear? Her tone threatening and dark. She had stopped dead in her tracks and was looking up at me with the familiar stone expression her husband had in that painting. The sudden change in her demeanor had taken me totally off guard as I simply stammered. Yes, I, I understand, ma'am. You'll have no trouble with me. Very well, then. Now, if you'll excuse me, I must continue tending the garden. If you'll be so kind as to head back inside, Mabel will show you to your room. You can start work tomorrow. Oh, and dinner is at 6.30. Like the passing of a black cloud, her expression returned to its previous gentleness, and she simply turned away and slowly made her way back towards the garden, leaving me with an uneasy feeling in the pit of my stomach. Weeks passed without further incident, 
and during that time I had made myself acquainted with the other laborers of the plantation grounds. My room was nestled on the second floor in the southern corner of the house, and though my room was smaller than your average bedroom, I had a window that faced the backyard and the garden. It soon became a daily ritual of watching the garden and the activities of Ms. Abigail. Before the crack of dawn and before retiring to my night's sleep, I would sit at my bed's edge, gazing out at the forbidden garden, wondering what type of flora or vegetable matter was germinating behind those organic walls. In addition, I started clocking the coming and goings of Ms. Abigail and her time within the garden. She seemed to spend more time hidden away in there than she did anywhere else, always donning that large floppy hat and gardening attire. There were a few times when she would join me for the day's meals, dressed in the same clothing, hat and all, sometimes covered in dirt, and the whole time acting as if it were required of her, all the while smiling and chatting on about everything, from the late Mr. Abigail to the weather. She would often ask me about the goings-on in town and elsewhere. You see, she never left the confines of the plantation's boundaries. Never. I can't recall her once ever going into town for any reason. Mabel would catch a ride with one of the farm hands and run into town for groceries and other supplies that were needed. When they returned, she would carry in several paper bags from the truck filled with various items and always a newspaper. The newspaper and the large Zenith radio in the parlor were the only connection to the outside world for the old woman. Saying that I found this profanely odd would be an understatement, but as it did not affect me or my duties, I simply brushed it off and chalked it up to an old woman's fear. I had heard stories of the elderly fearing the outside world and adopting the life of a hermit in the comforting walls of their homes. I presumed this was the case and thought nothing more about it. It was now Labor Day weekend, and Ms. Abigail had granted the staff that Sunday and Monday off. No one dared question in her reasoning and had cleared out of there faster than shit through a goose in case she changed her mind. The weather that weekend was partly cloudy and a cool breeze blew in from the east. A break in this stubborn heat was a blessing, and I had taken this opportunity to replace some of the slate shingles on the house. Crawling around on a scorching roof with the sun beating down on you like Satan's breath was not something I particularly was looking forward to, so today provided an opportune time to knock out this undertaking. When I look back on it, I wonder if anyone realized that I had stayed behind. I had looked at the roof a couple of days prior and knew what I needed for the repairs. They kept the spare slate shingles stacked under the front porch, and that's where I was when the car came up the road to the house. I was taking my time under the porch since it was at least ten degrees cooler there. Even the earth had a pleasant chill to the touch. I was in the process of pulling the slate from the pile when I heard the car approaching. When it pulled up to the front stairs, I set the shingles aside for a moment to see who was paying us a visit, since outsiders rarely made appearances here. I quietly crept up to the lattice and peered through. The vehicle was a ragged gray Mercury 8 with worn white wall tires. Emerging from the car, with the sound of a squealing door being opened, was a tall, thin man, dressed in a wrinkled brown suit. His face reminded me of a bird for some reason. Clutched in his hand was a briefcase as beat up as his car. As he stood, insufficiently trying to brush the dust from his suit, I heard the screen door open above me and the heavy footfalls of Mabel as she came onto the porch. For a moment, I thought back to the time when I had first came up to the house and Mabel emerged to greet me. Good day, ma'am. He spoke in a whining voice as he continued to dust himself off. And my name is Harold Dennins, and I would appreciate it if I could speak with the man of the house. I represent Sheer Cutlery and wish to offer him some superb savings on Miss Abigail runs the house. She in the back tending the garden if you need to speak to her. 
Mabel cut him off with that I could give two shits who you are tone. I knew it all too well by now. Oh, okay. I would appreciate that if I could. Mm-hmm. Mabel heavily descended the porch stairs, causing a rain of dust and dirt to fall upon me from the floor planks above. As luck would have it, she took the opposite side of the porch from where I had removed that lattice to gain entrance to the slate, making my presence still unknown. I waited until they rounded the side of the house before I crawled out into the sun. I could still hear that salesperson talking up his pitch to Mabel as they disappeared around the corner. Like that Mr. Dennings, I brushed the dirt from myself and made my way to the back of the house, hugging the building's side as I moved. Unlike myself, who had waited in the house's parlor, Mabel was taking this man straight to the garden, it seemed. When I reached the back edge of the house, I paused and poked my head around the corner. Mabel and Dennins were slowly making their way across the lawn toward the garden, Dennins still bending her ear with talk of superior kitchen knives as they walked. My curiosity was peaking as this was the first time I had seen any stranger, which we had next to none, being escorted straight to that forbidden garden. When they reached the garden's arch, I could no longer hear Dennins' ramblings, but it seemed that Mabel was making him wait outside the garden's access as she fetched Miss Abigail. After a few brief moments, Mabel reappeared and took Dennins by his arm and was actually leading him in. What the fuck is all this about? I whispered aloud to myself. After the speech I was handed, they gave this guy the red carpet right through the front door. It seemed like an eternity before both Mabel and Miss Abigail appeared from the hedges and began walking back to the house. Harold Dennings, with his bird face and his wrinkled suit, was nowhere to be seen. I moved away from the rear of the house, rubbing the back of my neck in confusion. What the hell is going on around here? I said aloud. Something odd was going on and my mind was racing, trying to figure out how I should approach this. Do I confront Miss Abigail about it? Ignore it or sneak into that garden myself and see what's going on for myself? But what if it turns out to be nothing and I'm caught snooping where I was told to avoid? That would be my ass for sure. Too many questions for my brain to process. I needed time to think. I decided to quickly and quietly make my way up to my room before the two made it into the house. Give myself some more time to calm down and ponder this in more depth. They'll probably think I went to town with the others and with a little luck maybe I could figure this all out. I made my way swiftly up the front porch and slowly slid through the screen door, making sure its rust and hinges did not betray my whereabouts. I then tiptoed up the stairs and paused at the top of the landing, faintly heard their voices as they climbed the stairs of the back porch. Come on, Timmy boy, you got this, I thought to myself as I glided down the hall and into my room. Ever so slowly, I pushed the door closed behind me as I heard them enter the house. I exhaled deeply. Now, to just sit down and figure this all out. I sat on the bed and turned my gaze to the garden. Still no bird face. Shadows from the trees stretched across the lawn as the sun was beginning its descent. Something told me I had seen the last of that Dennings fellow. I exhaled again. My body was relaxing now. What I needed was to lie down and keep a low profile until I could think straight. I undid the laces on my work boots and swung my legs up onto the bed. Yeah, that's exactly what I need to do. My muscles were loosening up as I stretched out on the mattress. You'll sort this mess out, I thought. I'll bet you're just working yourself into a frenzy over nothing. My eyes became heavy as sleep was beckoning me. Getting all worked up over nothing. Darkness swept over me as I drifted off. Mr. Hawthorne. I was resurfacing from the realm of sleep by slight nudges. Mr. Hawthorne. My name was called again. I shifted in the bed, my eyes opening to a blurred vision of Mabel standing over me. 
There he is, spoke Abigail. She was standing in the open doorway. My vision slowly began to focus, and I sat up on my elbows. I'm sorry. I was going to start up on the roof, and I must have. I started to explain when Mabel's large, meaty fist crashed into my face. Stars danced before my eyes as I fell back onto the bed. Blood was flowing from my nose and began spilling over my lips. Its coppery taste was entering my mouth. My eyes began to tear. You'd had been better off in town, Mr. Hawthorne, Abigail voiced. I instinctively covered my face and sat up again. Mabel's hand was coming down for a second blow, but now I could see it clutched one of my work hammers. Even though I could see what was about to transpire, the event boggled my mind and was still trying to process what was happening. My reaction was anything but swift. The hammer came down upon my head in a blinking flash of searing white, and I was unwittingly pulled back under the waves of unconsciousness. The deep, stabbing pain in my skull caused me to briefly awaken occasionally. I was being carried over Mabel's shoulder. We were descending a set of stairs, and with each step, my head would bounce about causing an electrical bolt of pain, reminded me I was still alive. I recalled being outside at one point. The cool evening air fanned my body, and the sound of crickets chirping and croaking frogs was almost deafening. That was all I could recollect until I was dropped. Just put him there, directed Abigail, and my body fell with a thud. As I laid on my back, I was aware of the strong, pungent odor of rich soil and fertilizer. I must be in the garden, I assumed. My head was spinning with vertigo, and the pain was relentless, but I laid motionless, letting my senses of smell and hearing detect what was going on around me. I needed some type of plan to remove myself from the growing conundrum I had found myself in. Use that spade. It's against the post, Abigail instructed. Dig the hole over there. Dig the hole? Well, that didn't sound good at all. Playing possum would not keep me out of some shallow grave. I needed to do something. Slowly, I rolled onto my side with a painful moan. Despite the agonizing pain, I forced my eyes open and strained to focus on my surroundings. I was indeed in the garden. All about me were numerous flower beds with wide varieties of plant life cultivated in them. I felt as if I were in a jungle by the overabundance. Even with all the vegetation encompassed here, I particularly noticed the green vines and their brightly colored yellow and red flowers from my initial visit. The vines seemed to entangle almost everything here. Thick wooden beams of the trellis rose from the ground in various locations, and they too were covered with vines and their yellow flowers. A lone kerosene lamp hung from a nearby beam by a jutting metal hook, illuminating the area in an eerie radiance. The sound of the spade digging into the earth drew my attention. Mabel was at the far end of the garden across from me. Her wide back faced me as she forced the spade deeper into the ground with each thrust. I pulled myself slowly up on my elbows and looked to my other side. To my horror, I found Denon. They had partially buried his body in the flower bed next to me. His bloodied face, frozen with a bewildered look upon it, was split wide open with a deep gash, probably made by the spade. Surprisingly, his glasses, as twisted as his expression was, somehow still clung to his face. I gasped and drew myself away. Abigail chuckled. I turned behind me to see her standing with her hands firmly on her hips. Shadows played upon her face from the lantern, making her eyes look insanely wide and menacing beneath her floppy hat. He, he won't bite you, Mr. Hawthorne, she laughed. He, he's as dead as a doornail. <sighs> what the fuck is going on? I put more distance between the bird face and myself. 
You wouldn't even understand if I told you. No one ever does. She extended her arm and pointed a shaking finger at Mabel. Now, Mabel, she understands. She knows exactly what the fuck is going on. Mabel stopped digging for a brief moment at the mention of her name, looked over her shoulder, then continued with the spade. Well, considering you ain't supposed to be breathing, I may just... Something stirred behind Abigail, causing her to pause. She turned around and ambled to the back of the garden. Mabel, too, had stopped and followed Abigail, leaving the spade planted in the soil. Painfully, I made it to my feet and shuffled towards where the spade was sticking out of the ground. As I passed a beam, I noticed a pitchfork propped up against it. I paused, looking at the spade, and then back to the pitchfork. Decisions, decisions. I chose the spade. Using the spade for more support, I hobbled to the back of the garden where Abigail and Mabel were. Both were standing in a flower bed with their backs to me. I couldn't see what they were looking at that held their attention so potently. Something rustled again, and I put the urge to split their heads aside and chose instead to move to an angle where I could see what they were peering at. In front of them stood a plant of monstrous size that was of the likes that I had never seen. It rose from the earth with a gigantic base that resembled what I can only describe as a pineapple. Its girth was big enough where it would take a good two people to wrap their arms around it. Large, thick green roots protruded from its base, gripping it in the natural foundation. The top of the pineapple was adorned with a massive yellow flower with red streaks similar to the ones that sprouted throughout the garden, except this flower's petals were closed like a huge tulip. The plant rustled again, and this time I saw it move. Something was moving inside that giant flower. My mouth was agape. Like with the hammer strike, my mind was having a real hard time wrapping around this. I looked over at the two women. Both had smiles on their faces, staring intently. I then turned back to the plant. It was then that I noticed something behind that big pineapple. I craned my neck and made out the form of a body sitting up against a beam directly behind the plant. My jaw dropped even more. The body was that of a long dead corpse dressed in slacks and a blazer. Aged rope fastened the corpse to the beam by being tied around its chest just under the arms. What was even more macabre about this discovery was that the green vines had crept up from the soil and ran into the pant legs and sleeves and emerged wherever they could and attached themselves all about the body. They had even managed to re-enter the body through the orifices of the head the mouth, nose, ears, and even the empty eye sockets. Little yellow flowers decorated the rotten cadaver like a morbid centerpiece. It was then it hit me like a bolt out of the blue. The head of the body was cocked unnaturally on its shoulder, its skull-like face staring out into oblivion but fixed in the position for me to make out the chilling feature on the gray leathery face. It bore a white handlebar mustache, the oil painting back in the parlor came rushing back into my mind's eye in vivid detail. It was that of Henry Abigail himself. My legs weakened and I clutched the spade tighter in fear of collapsing. I turned toward Abigail, my mouth still open like a village idiot. I tried to speak, but my mouth was beyond dry and I could not find any words. It was then that the plant rustled again. Something moved about within the petals like a fetus in a wound. And then, without warning, the petals opened up in a blooming fashion to a similar sound of celery slowly being broken in half. Revealed within the blossomed petals was nothing short of some sickening abomination. A partial upper male torso of a human body had replaced the flower's style and stigma. 
Its skin was a grotesque yellow complexion covered in some type of plasma that glistened in the light. A hairless body ever so gently swaying like a lover's dance. The arms of this monstrosity were contorted and deformed. Its right one resembled more of a gnarled root than an arm and was fused into the torso, while the left one was of unnatural length and folded like a chicken wing. The fingers, twice as long as those of a normal hand, were curled into a claw. My grip on sanity was loosening as I too, like the women, was transfixed on this thing that was neither plant nor man. Oh, Henry. Abigail spoke in an adoring way as she inched closer to the thing, her hand now slowly reaching out and touching the face of the wretched horror. Oh, Henry, she repeated. My mind, for whatever reason, shifted gears and for the time being diverted insanity. It now soaked up the vile scene that was unfolding before me and began analyzing it. This plan had somehow absorbed the body of Henry Abigail joining the two in some hellish marriage. Was he dead or alive during this process? One can only guess, but the rope securing the body could only suggest he was probably alive. But why? That was the question. My eyes wrenched themselves away from the late Henry Abigail and scanned the grounds of the garden. It was only now that I saw more of this botanical nightmare. Sowed all around me in the flower beds were the human remains of the fertilizer used for this plant. Bodies in various stages of decay were buried haphazardly in the soil all around the plant's establishment. Arms, legs, and half-covered bodies of men and women protruded from the ground, all covered in vines and flowers. What madness was this, and how long had this been going on? These poor souls had probably been past workers or passers-by who unfortunately paid a visit here, unknown to the mortal danger that awaited them all. Grab the jar, Mabel. I heard Abigail from behind me. Funny, I had almost forgotten they were here. I turned and saw Mabel bending down where the pitchfork was and lifting a large mason jar. She then moved to Abigail and handed her the jar. Abigail was now gently caressing the face of the monster. My head tilted to the side and my mouth was agape again and I was sure that I was about to witness another unsightly event. Here, darling, here it is. She whispered as she raised the jar to the thing's sealed lips. Its eyes were closed, but now they slowly opened, revealing eyes as black and shiny as an eight ball. As if it had done this prior, the lips parted and regurgitated a milky liquid that started filling the jar. Abigail held close. She shifted the jar, trying to catch every drop of the substance, yet some flowed over her hand and down its chin regardless. The thing continued to vomit until the jar was half filled. Then, as it completed its task, it leaned back slightly and closed its eyes once more. Abigail stepped away and held the jar up in front of her. Tilting her head back, she did the unthinkable and pressed the jar to her own lips and greedily drank from it. She guzzled down the milky vomit as if she hadn't drunk in days, causing some to dribble down the sides of her mouth. It was at that moment when she tilted her head far enough back to finish the jar's contents that her floppy hat fell away from her head revealing her bald and head with small yellow flowers and tiny vines embedded into her scalp. I doubled over and wretched. A man can only take so much without breaking down somehow, and I had gone over my limit. Abigail handed the jar off to Mabel. Her eyes were again insanely wide and maniacal, as the grin was now on her milk-encrusted lips. Using the back of her hand, she wiped the residue from her mouth. Her tongue licked her lips, tasting what she had missed. Do I sicken you, Mr. Hawthorne? Does this place offend you? I told you that you wouldn't understand. I told you. 
What you see here before you is a miracle. This is insanity, I spat back. No, no, no. You've seen it with your very own eyes, and yet you deny it? She bent down and pulled her floppy hat off the ground and placed it back on her head. This is a miracle, Mr. Hawthorne, and miracles come at a price. My husband was a sick man. He knew he was living on borrowed time. He knew that there was only one way to continue on. I noticed at the corner of my eye that Mabel was ever so slowly sliding down onto my flank, her moves cautious and indiscreet. The seeds were from India, you see. Very expensive, Mr. Hawthorne, very expensive. I believe the people there called them soul trees. Yes, that was it, soul trees. She held her finger to her chin, thinking. To be consumed by one is to find immortality, they say. It was then that Mabel made her move and lunged at me. I wasn't asleep in my bed this time around, and I instinctively swung the spade at a deadly arc. Ah! With a bone-crunching smack, the spade's edge caught her in the temple with such force that it cut through her skull and eye socket, then embedded itself halfway through her nose. The blow had stopped her dead in her tracks. I released the handle and watched her take a few steps backwards with the spade still sticking out of her face and her arms outstretched like those of a sleepwalker. She faltered for a moment as blood sprayed in all directions like a boat that had sprung a leak, her lone eye wide in disbelief. Then as she fell backwards, her outstretched arm clipped a lantern, sending it flying off its hook. Glass shattered and flaming kerosene splashed over the area, igniting all it touched as it landed near Denon's body. You motherfucker! What are you doing? Her hands waving in a frenzy while she screamed obscenities. The fire was spreading rapidly, eagerly consuming the plant life and especially the old wooden frames of the trellis. The evening breeze fanned the hungry flames, causing them to accelerate their destructive engulfment. I turned to Abigail, who was sobbing uncontrollably, her face buried in her hands. I looked about getting my bearings, then reached for the pitchfork. Gripping the handle, I charged towards Abigail. Like a soldier with a fixed bayonet, I drove the sharp prongs deep into her midsection and continued pushing, my legs pumping like pistons. I scarcely heard her gasp as the prongs entered her to their full length. Pushing with all the strength I could muster, I pushed her backwards until she tripped up on her steps and fell back against the plant's base. Her floppy hat had fallen away again, and her apron was now stained crimson. I released the pitchfork and stood back, my chest heaving as my lungs struggled for breath. The air was swirling with smoke, and I now felt the temperature rise to a sweltering level. It was time to flee before the flames swept over this entire garden. My attention was now drawn back to the creature. The heat was singeing its giant petals, turning them a grayish color. The torso was writhing in which I could only guess was pain, twisting and convulsing with its mouth in a silent scream and black eyes bulging wide, its lone limb contorting in agony. It was then I heard Abigail belch forth a loud primal grunt. I turned to see her sitting up. Her hands were fixed on the pitchfork and slowly pulling it out of her. Her face was a grimace of rage and determination. I could not believe my eyes. Her unnatural strength and stamina must have derived from the filth she consumed from the jar. I moved forward to meet her, grabbing the handle once more and pushing forward using my body's weight to drive the spikes back home and even further until they protruded from her back and penetrated the husk in the plant's base, pinning her to the pineapple. I don't think so, I snarled in her face, her eyes gazing at me in an empty stare. 
The plant shook violently, and I jumped back to watch the torso withdraw itself into the pineapple base, sinking into the base like a turtle withdrawn into the safety of its shell. I stepped away. There was nothing more to see or do at this point. I turned and looked around for an escape route. The fire had claimed everything behind me, leading back to the garden's archway. It left me with little choice. Somehow, I heard the structure breaking and boards falling. It was definitely time to go. My window of opportunity was diminishing by the second. The hedges surrounding the garden were ablaze but were the only way out now. The choking thick smoke was becoming overwhelming, leaving me with only one way out through the hedges. Covering my face with my arm, I put my head down and rushed forward into the flaming hedge. I felt my flesh burn as I propelled myself into and out the other side, landing on the lawn. Without hesitating, I rolled on the lawn, extinguishing any parts of my clothing that may have caught and climbed to my feet. I realized I had lost both my socks as I felt the grass beneath my bare soles. I shuffled quickly away and collapsed under a tree a safe distance away. It was there I sat, propped up against the tree, watching the trellis and the garden within burn like a funeral pyre. The entire backyard was illuminated. I'll bet the glow from the fire could be seen back in town. Cracking embers drifted upward into the night air like infernal fireflies as I sat pondering all the questions that remained unanswered. Perhaps it was best if they remained unanswered. After I rested for a spell, I would get in my car and drive into town and seek the sheriff. I would have to leave out the part about that. What did she call it again? A soul tree. Yeah, that was something that had to be seen to be believed. A smirk crossed my lips as I drifted off. No sane or sober man would ever believe the night I had. I awoke pre-dawn in time to glimpse the moon as it sank behind the distant treetops. Smoke from the smoldering trellis filled the yard like a choking mist. I heard birds begin to sing, announcing the approaching morning. My head throbbed and I rubbed my temples in a futile attempt to ease the pain. Besides my head injury, I had to admit that I wasn't feeling too bad. Nothing a hot bath and a full day of sleep in a soft bed wouldn't cure. I could easily fall back to sleep, but it was probably best if I tried to get up and get this started sooner than later. Tried to get up? I went to lift my legs and they met resistance. I looked down and trembled. Both of my legs were covered in green vines and decorated with small yellow flowers. The vines had sprouted from the very ground underneath me and crept up into my pant legs and over my pants and up my hips, clinging to my limbs firmly. From behind, I heard something move against the tree at my back and felt the grip on my shoulder. Hawthorne. The rasping voice hissed in my ear. Well, sometimes you eat your vegetables, and sometimes the vegetables eat you. I hope you all enjoyed Death's Garden by our pal Frederick Pangborn. A little about the author. Frederick Pangborn is a short story horror author with just over 100 stories written, with the majority of them in publication. His two latest anthologies, Hellish Consequences and Dreamers of the Tomb, can be found on Amazon. A retired law enforcement officer and former U.S. Marine, he's happily retired in Florida. Thanks, Frederick. And do old Drew Blood a favor, would you? Subscribe to his podcast wherever you do your listening and leave him a five-star review and a kind word, even if you're listening on YouTube. He needs soldiers on all fronts to win this battle, and he appreciates it.
To hear a premium ad-free edition of tonight's and all the other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click Patrons in the upper menu. You'll find yourself at ChillinTalesForDarkNights.com, where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to their entire audio archive, all ad-free and available to download or stream. Thank you for your time and for supporting our sponsors. When you support our sponsors, you support this show. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chillin' Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all the latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with them each and every week. Oh, and you can find Drew Blood on Facebook and Instagram, and sometimes Twitter. The Drew Blood's Dark Tales podcast is accepting submissions, friend. If you've got a story or two you'd like to be featured on the show, send it to drewbloodhorror at gmail.com. If selected, you'll get the full treatment, 10 bananas. Well, I'm afraid this is where we part ways, at least till next week. So grab a drink for the road, friend. If you see Paul out there, tell him I'm waiting for my slice of pie. I'd like to say hey to a couple more listeners of the show. Jared Willis and Coleman Phillips. Hey, fellas. I really appreciate the comments. means a lot to me. So, Mr. Jared Willis and Coleman Phillips, may the wind be at your back and may the road rise up to meet you. See you all on Cinco de Mayo. Until then, buenos fuckos. <laughs> Gee. Good night, y'all. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.